Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm Maggie from the Waterbury Library next door. And I'm so pleased to introduce John Malter today. He's from Mad River Resource Management Alliance. And he's going to give us the full rundown on all things composting. Um, this is our first in-person program in months. So it's so exciting to see your faces. We really appreciate you all masking up and coming out to learn something together. It's good to see a community space, even if it is spread apart. So I'm going to give it over to John, because he's the one who's got something to say. Thank you, Maggie. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, I want to welcome you all to the uh, workshop on how to uh, attract bears to your backyard. <laughs> This is, by the end of this uh, session, hopefully we'll be able to avoid that uh, as part of the program. And uh, I've got a bunch of handouts that I've put on your sheets so that whether you want to pay attention to me or not, you can take all that stuff home and you'll know a lot more than I do. So it'll be OK. Um, a little housekeeping. There is a restroom out there, restrooms out there. Uh, it's two dollars to use it, but uh, all the money goes back to the library, so just kidding. Uh, also, uh, has anybody who's here signed up to pick up a bin after the class? Okay, okay. So when I get everything broken down after this, we'll meet over at the Waterbury Armory behind the uh, Thatcher Brook Primary School. It'll probably be about a half hour after this is done. So just be patient, and we'll meet over there. Uh, just a little background. I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, a little bit about the Mad River Resource Management Alliance, give you a sense of who I am and what we are. And the alliance was formed in 1994. It's a group of uh, communities that were formed through a what's called an interlocal agreement. It includes Faston, Moortown, Waitsfield, Warren, and Waterbury. And we provide some of the uh, solid waste special programs that aren't done through the private sector, such as Rodney's transfer station, uh, Casella's transfer station down in Waitsfield, and the local curbside collections that are done around town. Uh, besides the composting workshops, we do the household hazardous waste collections. Uh, and we've got one coming on October 3rd over at Harwood. And there'll be a lot more publicity on that. We had to uh, cancel the one in the spring because of uh, the virus. And so we're expecting a pretty good turnout for the fall collection. Uh, we also provide some support to uh, green up, and uh, we do tire collections. We uh, work with uh, the Wheels for Warmth folks. We uh, uh, also uh, do a newsletter twice a, w a year on uh, various programs and uh, try to um, provide assistance to the folks within our communities on a lot of things, all things solid and resource management wise. Uh, I'm curious, before we go much further, how many of you are already composting? OK. And so everybody is more or less a composter or is a wannabe. That'll be good. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about all that. Um, we uh, also, as part of our program, we do a uh, a solid waste implementation plan, which is kind of a uh, mirroring of the state, uh, the state's uh, materials management plan, which talks about goals and activities that are required for all areas of the state to accomplish things like getting recycling done, getting a uh, reduction in the amount of waste being generated. Uh, dealing with uh, composting, dealing with household hazardous waste, primarily with education, uh, both at the business level and at the schools, and a variety of other 
activity. So these are all things that the uh, Alliance as a solid waste management entity provides through the solid waste uh, implementation plan. And we upgrade that every, uh, we get, have an amendment of that every five years, and we put out data on it every year. And our goal is to reduce the amount of waste that's generated since there is only one landfill in this state. We want to uh, preserve our resources. We want to look at uh, how we can manage things in the best possible way. Effectively, we are going from a linear economy where you dug out stuff from the ground, you made it into a widget, you sold the widget to a consumer, the consumer used the widget, and then it was thrown out into the landfill. Now we want to take and manufacture the widget, sell it to the consumer, the consumer finishes with it, we have a stewardship program that takes the widget back. It goes back and gets demanufactured and made into new widgets. So we can change the concept of use and dispose, cradle to grave, to cradle to cradle. And that's really what product stewardship's all about. And I like to think that we're a, a vehicle of change in helping to make this all happen. Uh, and Vermont is a leader nationally in accomplishing this. And I think our legislature, representing all of us, has been uh, very foresighted in saying, you know, we support this concept in uh, preserving our resources for our future. And uh, so they've passed a lot of legislation over the uh, years. And since uh, 2012, when the uh, Universal Recycling Act was passed, we've had a lot of stuff that has been going from the trash bin to the recycle bin and to the compost bin. And things like uh, uh, your uh, plastics, one and two, there are uh, mandatory recycling of plastics, one and two, and papers and uh, some of the uh, uh, metal containers uh, and glass containers, uh, instead of going in the trash, those are all being properly managed that way. And with the, the organic waste, uh, food scraps especially, this has been ramping up since uh, the 2012 legislation where we've captured uh, the largest generators of these wastes uh, going from the big restaurants and grocery stores to smaller facilities, right down to uh, now in 2020 on July 1st, uh, us. So it's taken a while, and we've tried to publicize the fact that this was coming for quite some time. And a lot of people have said, this makes sense. And the bears have been saying, this makes sense too. <laughs> but uh, enough of the bears for now. Uh, we also, uh, in 2019, the legislature passed the Single Use uh, Products Act, which said that uh, retail facilities will no longer uh, sell or uh, provide things like plastic grocery bags, um, uh, uh, styrofoam uh, cups and uh, uh, packaging uh, for uh, clamshell packaging. Uh, it also is things like uh, 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 stirs, plastic stirs for coffee and plastic straws. So now, you know, if you go to a, 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 a a restaurant, you have to ask specifically for a straw if you've got a need, or you can get a metal straw and bring it with you and use it and do that, or get a wooden stirrer, or use your finger. <laughs> finger is definitely the preferred method for that. It doesn't work as well for sipping a beverage, though. Um, the state is actively involved in product stewardship 
as I mentioned earlier, one of the big things that we do is uh, e-waste collection. This has been going on since about 2011, where people can bring their computers, printers, monitors, and televisions, and all their peripherals to a facility to be recycled at no charge. And the closest one around here is the state surplus property uh, facility right over on uh, Route 2, about a mile and a half beyond the roundabout, west of the roundabout. Uh, that's one of the main things. Uh, we also, and they'll take other electronic material, but they do have a per pound charge for that. And I think it's 50 cents a pound right now. So if you've got a DVD player or a I'd say a radio or a record player, or I'm dating myself, uh, or uh, a copier machine. Those are all things that they can take as well. Uh, also, uh, we are now through the uh, 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 Paint and Coatings uh, Association able to take uh, all the uh, oil and latex architectural paints back at uh, both our household hazardous waste events and our, uh, uh, several of our retail establishments around uh, the Alliance and around the state. And places like Obishans and True Value Hardware, Kenyon's down in the valley, uh, uh, Bisbee's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Kenyon's, but Bisbee's down in the valley do take uh, the paints as uh, part of their program, yeah. I'm not sure which category dead light bulbs fall into, but where do they go? Okay, and that's another one, and I was just going to get to oh, light bulbs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fluorescent bulbs, compact fluorescent bulbs, uh, and the longer tubes can also go to uh, our household hazardous waste collections, as well as to uh, the True Value Hardware and Bisbee's. Uh, the Earthwise Transfer Station takes them down in the, uh, in the valley. Uh, and uh, I believe Obishans also takes the fluorescent bulbs. Uh, you want to check on that. You want to check on all these, but they, I believe they are all taking these at this time. And there is a listing. You can go online. You can find all this stuff either through uh, the, uh, the Vermont call to recycle for uh, there's batteries. Uh, there's the e-cycle uh, hotline uh, on the state uh, website. You can get that information as well as on our uh, website, which is madriverrma.org. And uh, so all this information is available, and it all is there to help make it easier to lighten our collective footprints as we go through our environmental lives. So, uh, compost. Yes, the reason everybody is here. Uh, you know, food scraps and other organic material, uh, leaf and garden waste, uh, all uh, contribute about 30% to our potential solid waste footprint. That was the amount of stuff that was added to the waste stream that was going in to the landfills. And it was pretty much a no-brainer that by taking that part out of the waste stream and using this as a resource, which it truly is, uh, was not a really hard thing to accomplish. And as I said earlier, the Universal Recycling Act incorporated that as the uh, the keystone, I feel, uh, for this whole program to uh, accomplish getting uh, us to a much uh, further goal in uh, managing our, our resources. Uh, so I don't know if y you, you want to be doing it with a compost bin or if you want to just have it in a do-it-yourself kind of operation, or you want to just take your, your uh, food scraps to a transfer station, it's all really up to your own personal desires. We don't really want you to just 
put it out for the bears. And that's part of what I'm, I'm here to talk about. Uh, so basically, uh, when you create a compost bin, or you, when you create compost, you're taking and developing a pile. And the goal of the pile is to take and reduce the amount of stuff you're putting in and ultimately getting out a bunch of pure uh, renewable uh, soil resource. And that is accomplished by starting a pile with uh, brown material. And I usually put a bunch of small twigs and branches on the ground, put about three or four inches of brown material, dried leaves and such, maybe some shavings, some wood shavings on the base. And then I'll start to develop layers. And the layers would be, uh, you're gonna take your food scraps, you're gonna take your, uh, your, your grass clippings, you're gonna take uh, freshly weeded material and add that right, right to the, uh, right to the uh, pile. And then you're gonna just start layering. And you're gonna wanna do this in a, a ratio of pretty much three to one, uh, and it's gonna be by volume because food scraps weigh a lot more than dry leaves. So you're gonna have maybe two or three inches of food scraps in your pile layered over by maybe six inches to eight inches of dry material, your, your carbon rich material over your food scraps, which are your nitrogen rich material. And you'll just start to build that pile. And what I try to do is as I'm building the pile, I add a couple of handfuls of soil, just throw it in uh, on top of the food scraps to begin the process. And what that adds is the, uh, the, uh, the fungus, the microbes, bacteria, the small micro sized uh, critters that eat and metabolize the food. And so it, it offers a, a uh, real opportunity to break down everything. So you start with that and you just keep adding layers and you get up to about three feet or so of material. And you want to, uh, you know, check and you, you want to add a little bit of water so you get a little bit of moisture to help with your, uh, with your uh, uh, pile. But you want your moisture to not be any more than if you grab a hold of a pile of your composting pile it's not gonna be more than, let's say, a wrung out sponge. So when you, you start to do this, you just look for that. And so you're gonna be building and building and building. And then if you're using a compost bin, what you do, uh, what you do is uh, just close it all up and uh, you can wait a couple of weeks, open the top up, and you'll notice that the pile has shrunk considerably. And that's because things are going to be uh, getting metabolized. They're going to be breaking down. They're going to be uh, drying out. Things are going to be happening. And the best way you can tell that things are happening is that you can uh, use one of these fancy thermometers. You can stick it in and you'll find temperatures going from 120 to 140, 150 degrees. And uh, this is really kind of a, a good thing. But if you don't have one of these things, we have a special added accessory. It's called your right hand, if you're right-handed, or your left hand, and just put it on your pile and you'll feel the warmth. I guarantee that as you work on this, you will start to uh, generate heat, especially during the 
spring, summer, fall months. Things get more challenging as we get into the winter. Uh, but what you're going to be doing as things start to uh, break down and you'll, you'll see things happening, you may want to turn your pile because what you want is a combination of nutrients, you want your, uh, your, your carbon rich material, you want air, you want oxygen to help keep the pile aerobic. And you can use one of these, which is a fancy store-bought oper operation that you can put into the, into the pile and then just pull it up and down. Uh, I go to some garage sales and I find this works really well. People thought these were really ice augers, but they're compost bin turners. You just open the top and you put it in and it's great for doing that. And usually frustrated fishermen are selling these for fairly little amounts of money. So these work well. Or you can uh, just take and pick up your bin and move it and then just take a pitchfork and move the pile as you go along. And what I find is that you can make, if you're a real hard driver, you can make compost in a month or so that you can start to harvest out of the bottom of your bin. But for the most part, people, I'm a, I'm a lazy composter. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make any bones about it. I'm, I'm a firm believer in the, in the bumper sticker, compost happens. <laughs> I mean, look at, the, look at the forests. All the leaves and everything that are out there, they're all composting. It just it takes time. And it's amazing how effectively compost will uh, break down. And uh, I can pass this around, I don't know, socially distancing. It's, uh, this is what the compost is, is all about. Mike? Yeah. It smells good, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know as I need to bring it to everybody, but. How big of a pile was it before this? Oh, that's a good question. I, my, I, this is just a little amount of, uh, I had a bigger bin than that, actually, but it, I, uh, I probably had about uh, a third of the volume of that was all full compost material. So, and I'll let people. Yeah, okay. pass around. Yeah, sure. Okay. about what you said about adding soil. Sure. Yeah. I'm super new to composting. Sure. Might be a silly question. There's no silly question. Like, should I go buy topsoil, like from the store, or is there like I can use like soil from my yard? Oh, by all means, go to the most expensive store you can find, <laughs> which hopefully is in your backyard. Uh, yeah, and, and I apologize, everybody, this is a totally open, please feel free to ask the questions because this is your workshop. I'm just here to facilitate. I want to learn because everybody's had experiences that can help each other out. As far as that goes, I usually just go out to the garden and take a, you know, a pail and bring it in and when I feel the urge, throw some new you know, bugs. You can go to Gardener Supply and buy a bottle that is this bacteria, the microbes, that you can do that to, but you don't need to. It really is uh, Mother Nature at its finest helping us all out collectively. So you want to you wanna consider that. Yeah. I, 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 I've got plenty of dry leaves, but they're basically oak. And I've heard something about you should limit oak leaves. Is there a, for brown, does it make a difference? Yeah, uh, oak is, uh, is a little bit of an issue. And actually, I think on page two, uh, boom, 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 boom. There was, oak leaves. Recommend shredding. They're very acidic 
and decompose slowly. So composting process will help counteract the acidity. So yeah, you can, but you just want to be, you know, astute about it and plant some other maples and other things. <laughs> solve, solve that problem. But yeah, you know, people worry about how exact everything has to be. Trust me, once I started putting in uh, food scraps and started building the pile, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible to watch it just never filling up. It's like, and until you get to the winter, and then you, you do have issues there, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the, the bottom line is stuff starts to decompose. The microbes really work at munching away at the food scraps and accomplishing uh, the goal of creating the composted material. And I use that composted material as a soil amendment in my garden. I add it to my, uh, my potted plants, and it just it helps everything. Yeah? Well, in decomposing part of, of different things, obviously, uh, lettuce and whatnot will decompose a lot quicker than bone or corn husk. So how do you know or you gauge what? Well, one thing, one thing you want to do is the more surface area you present, in terms of making things break down, the quicker things are gonna uh, uh, decompose. So if you've got like uh, uh, a lot of uh, watermelon rind, you wanna chop it up, make it smaller, but smaller makes it larger. It's kind of a counterintuitive, but that's basically what you're creating is more surface area. Uh, when we talk about bones, when we talk about other things, that's kind of a trigger because uh, while we say food scraps are banned from the, uh, from the landfill, uh, there is the caveat that meat, bones, fish, uh, and oils are not banned from the landfill. They can still go in your trash. Now, you can also put them in a green cone. And a green cone here is a solar digester. Basically, you're not going to be recovering uh, composted material from that. But what it will do is break down the, the various materials that you put in there. And you could put food, other food scraps in there. You're just going to be digesting them effectively, and it will break down to carbon dioxide and water and will run off into the, uh, into the ground because um, much of it, at least to about here, is going to be under the ground. You're going to dig a hole and put it in. So you're going to need to look at the uh, soil that you've got. If it's a really clayey soil, you're gonna have to add some gravel or some uh, sand and gravel to make sure you're able to percolate the material that you're putting in. And you're also gonna wanna consider things like, uh, if it smells really good, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure you've got some chicken wire and some rocks around the bottom so that skunks and raccoons don't try to enjoy the, 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 the uh, wares that you're creating here. And trust me, I've been through all of that. Um, also, with the compost bin, when you set it up, you can do one of two things. You can just put it right on the ground. Well, even let's go one step back. Where do you want to set up your compost bin? You want to set it up someplace where you're going to use it. That's, a, that's always a good thing. So you're not going to want it in the back 40 if you're taking stuff out of your kitchen when you think about how long a trek it's going to be to get to where you're, uh, you're taking your stuff. So I usually, uh, well, I have mine uh, down at the, uh, it's probably about 40 feet out from my house. And uh, 
beyond the end of my driveway. Uh, you want to watch out for things like don't put it under the eaves of your roof of your house because ice will come down and redesign the <laughs> compost bin. Uh, you want to have it so that it's not right on your driveway so that the plow in the winter comes and also fine tunes your compost bin. And ideally, you want it in an area where it's relatively sunny so that it helps to heat up uh, the contents of the bin. Uh, so now you've got the bin. You set it up and put it right on flat ground because it's so much easier on flat ground. Uh, and you can look at one of two things. Do I want critters to come in from below or do I not want critters to come in from below? Now, if you have critters uh, coming in from below, the good news is that they're helping to aerate the bin. You get uh, things like mice and snakes that kind of like that nice warm weather, that environment that is there. And so that's good. But if you're the kind of person who you open the bin and there's a snake looking at you, uh, and you decide you never want to see a compost bin again, you may want to not do that. But I think uh, for the most part, I've been really you know, happy with sharing the, the goods with them. Uh, plus, it, it really does help. And you know, bugs and everything will get in there, and that's, that's OK. But you can also put a quarter inch to half inch hardware cloth on the bottom, and that will prevent any critters from coming in from below. And that'll solve the problem of uh, having to manage that kind of, of material. Now, you, you never want to have an issue like I had where I opened my bin, which I had, I, it was a bin I hadn't used for a couple of years, but I wanted to show somebody and I opened the bin and a bunch of yellow jackets had decided time to make a nice warm nest or comfortable nest. And uh, so that was my, my uh, uh, compost bin injury story. Uh, one way to get rid of uh, them, and it works not just for uh, compost bins, but you can uh, get some uh, essential oil of peppermint and uh, take a tablespoon of that and mix it with, uh, I think it's four cups of uh, water. And put it in a spray container and just spray it on the, uh, on, on the, uh, the, the, the nest in the area. And they don't like this peppermint smell. However, you know, it's, everybody's up to their own thing. Tap it hard before you open it up, right? <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you hear a lot of buzzing, you'll know you've got issues. <laughs> but, but yeah, there, and, and you know, the, uh, the bins are designed so that they can have air uh, and w water coming in, and that's important to the, the whole process. But you know, the, these little buggers are able to get in as well, so you want to be a little bit sensitive to that kind of issue. Yeah? Hey, you mentioned when you're starting out maybe spraying some water, which I didn't do. And, but with this kind of bin, I thought, the, I thought it said that it lets rainwater in. So it does. Is there no further need to add water? If you, you, are, you are your own monitor. So what you want to do is take in, like I said, check it out and feel how the material is doing. And if you can kind of squeeze it, and it's a little bit like a wrung out sponge, you've got the ideal moisture content for the, 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 the composting process. If you feel like it's too, uh, wet, you may want to add a little bit more dry material. You may want to uh, let the air onto everything. You know, if you've got it in a sunny area, just let everything dry out a bit. Or you may want to add, you know, put your garden hose or a water uh, can and just put a little moisture in. So, you know, everything, everybody's compost is a little bit different. 
You know, you are making your own designer compost. <laughs> and, and so when you're considering your holiday gifts this year, you're going to be all getting your, your recycled containers and you're gonna fill them with your compost. And this is gonna be this most special gift you're gonna to give to your significant others. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's one thing to, to consider there. I do have another question for you. Sure. You had mentioned as somebody else's question about like oak leaves being more acidic. So does that also apply to like green scraps that are acidic, like citrus rinds and things like that? All those things you want to you you know you want to consider that as possible. Uh, you know the chemistry of of the foods that you're adding, but you can add it. It's just be a little bit sensitive to to what you're putting in. But for the most part, you're adding enough stuff that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a, a major critical amount. Yeah? I was surprised to see that lint is OK to put in your compost. And I was wondering, you know, with microplastics, whether that's. Well, I, I didn't hear. Uh, I was surprised to see that lint is OK. Lint, oh, yeah, yeah. But what about microplastics in a lot of. OK, now, lint is OK if you're using wool and other natural fabrics. If you're using a lot of synthetic fabrics, it's not going to help you. So yes, you're right. And that's, you know, that's where we get back to how natural we are or we aren't. And, uh, it, you know, lint is a, is a good thing to, to do if you're, you know, if the majority of your clothes are not synthetic. But if they are, it should go in the trash. That would be my, my advice on that. Um, other things uh, to consider, uh, compost tea. Uh, take some of your compost, uh, put it in a, a, a bag, a, uh, like a potato sack, uh, fill a bucket with water, and just dunk it in there and let it stay for a couple of days and then you can use that nutrient-rich uh, water as a, uh, a source to water your, your plants. And it really adds an extra zing to, uh, zing, that's a technical term. <laughs> it adds an extra special something uh, to, your, uh, to your plants and helps in, the, uh, in their development. So that's a, that's a good thing. I'm glad that's where you went. I wasn't sure when you said composting tea. <laughs> <Some> tea? <laughs> well, you can you know you can compost your tea bags and you can compost <laughs> coffee. Uh, you know, take your little K cups and dump them out and put that in there and, and do that. Um, so you've got all that. Um, those are those are some of the major things. Oh, when you're when you're setting up your your uh, food scraps, and uh, let me see if I can do this here. These are just the examples of the, uh, the food scrap containers that you can use. They can come larger. You can go and get a five gallon bucket. I had some of these. These are like five bucks a piece if anybody needs to have something of that nature. You can put it, they're small enough, you can put it right next to your sink or uh, on the side of your kitchen counter. Uh, you want to be con considering uh, things like fruit flies. And uh, fruit flies like food scraps. It's kind of like uh, Ben and Jerry, fruit flies, food scraps. Uh, this is the answer. Uh, take, a, take a soda bottle, ideally one that's easy to cut around, invert it and fill about a quarter of an inch with uh, 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 apple cider or apple vinegar or wine vinegar or whatever. And uh, fruit flies really like it. And they have a hard time figuring out how to get out of the funnel. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really into the peace, love and everything. But when it comes to fruit flies, put them in here. <laughs> And uh, you know you may need a couple, depending. But the other thing is, if you're getting too many fruit flies, take your food scraps out more frequently. Make sure you wash your container, 
and do all that. I say that as I know how I have not been doing that all that well. How much vinegar did you say you should put in there? Put about a quarter of an inch. Uh -oh. And it'll, you, you'll, it'll evaporate, and you'll need to re oh, replenish it yeah. and stuff. Uh, when you're taking, whoop. When you're taking your food scraps, uh, when you're taking your compost out, out of the bin, you're going to want to uh, put it on a screen so that where you might have some pieces, some chunks left over, you can uh, just put them back into the bin afterwards for some further uh, breaking down. And uh, you can get this. You can make a larger uh, screen with uh, hardware cloth and laying it right over a wheelbarrow and then just mixing it and dropping it down and going from there. It's really, you know, your own preference. Uh, the use of, uh, the, use of uh, the, the sieve is more, uh, I think, to give you uh, better, better uh, you know, composition of the compost itself and let the rest of it re redevelop. But you don't need to do that. Like I say, it again becomes personal choice on how you want to work with any of this stuff. Uh, then we come to the subject that I think everybody has been waiting for, Mr. Beer. Uh, a quick anecdote, a couple of weeks ago, I had a bear come to my garbage. And uh, it wasn't very much garbage. It wasn't, I didn't think, very tasty. But he took my garbage and dragged it up into the woods, had his way with it. I went up into the woods and took it all back, put it back in the garbage can, put the cover on, put my thing that I had on top of it, which didn't matter. <laughs> Two days later, he came back and did the same thing with the same garbage, not added anything to it. So you know, as far as tastes go, they, he didn't have much. But my reason for saying this is that 20 feet away, I had a compost bin, and he didn't even touch that. Mm -hmm. And that is because, uh, number one, Bears have really good noses, you know, Smokey the bear growling and howling and sniffing the air. Well, he's sniffing away. And they say that a bear can smell food two miles away. Now, with all those choices, if you've done your food composting correctly, he's going to go to your neighbor and you'll be OK. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is, you want to damp down the odors. And the best way to do that is by ensuring that you've put enough carbon-rich material over any of your food scraps. And that will deter the bear. And bears are really a, a creature, creature of habit, and they will come back and visit again and again if you have been visited. So there are a couple of other things that you can do to encourage them going elsewhere. You know, the sign that's got the picture of the bear with the circle and the slash doesn't work. <laughs> Trust me on that. Uh, what you want to look at is uh, you can take out some ammonia uh, soaked rags and put it around your compost, which uh, would, if I was doing that, I wouldn't be composting. But some people might not feel that bad about using ammonia. Uh, another thing would be to have an electrified fence and then just putting a nice piece of uh, peanut butter or bacon right about snoot level and then when the bear comes over and has an opportunity to touch that with his nose or mouth, he's going to get a shock. And hopefully, we'll remember this and 
exit stage what right. Uh, I would just have a regular, uh, you know, like garden, garden uh, fence, electric fence. I don't know what it would be. It's uh, car battery size. So uh, that would definitely make a difference. But the odor reduction is really the key to dealing with the bears. And if they keep coming back consistently, you may want to hold off for a bit on uh, composting until uh, you've gone through a couple of weeks and then you know the bear will have gone off to greener pastures and you can then have a better option for going back to it. Uh, and during that period of time, you can use a transfer station or you can store stuff in your freezer if you want to. And you know, it, and it, then it comes down to the winter and what do we do for managing our food scraps in the winter. Uh, I continue to put stuff in my compost uh, bins. I have more than one. Uh, and it's a, you're, you're, you're gonna be really a hard driver if you're able to make your compost happen during the heart of the Vermont winter. Because it really takes uh, temperature and mixing and stuff tends to freeze up. It really is a, an operation where you say, I'm just gonna add the stuff. Maybe there'll be a couple of thaws and things will move around. You'll be able to get more in. But for the most part, I put my stuff that's uh, food scraps, I wait until it's good and cold. I put it out in a in a garbage can and just store it in the in an open bay in my garage. And the bears ideally have gone to sleep and so I don't have an issue. Now the thing is you want to make sure you've got the bears talking to you at the right, you know, level so that you know that they're not going to be getting up before the uh, before you're able to put that stuff in the bin. So this is, this is all part and parcel of what we're up to and about. Uh, those are the, the main things about the composting. I did want to show you the, uh, changing the subject a little. We do, in Vermont, everybody is using recycled product in their, in their lives. All of our Vermont license plates are made with 50% recycled aluminum. And I'm really pleased that this has been going on since the 1980s now. So this is one thing. Uh, and then I've got, I have a few copies of uh, some magnets here for household batteries and some food scrap decals. And I do have a few of these that we could sell ya. And uh, I just have my library here of stuff. And then recognizing single use re, uh, versus uh, reusable bags. I know here in Waterbury, the Rotary Club is selling through various stores the single use bags. There's a lot of other ones out there. Everybody now has probably pretty much uh, gotten into the, 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 the rhythm of using re reusable bags. I mean, it's really funny. I, I look at what's been going on when it comes to uh, recycling 20 or 30 years ago and making people aware of what you can recycle and not recycle and seeing the development of that and how you know, there were people who were opposed to doing that stuff and, uh, and things changed over time. And, I, and I, I really think very much that Vermonters are more keenly attuned to the, the right thing when it comes to this. But uh, now when it comes to things like composting, single use products, uh, the, re, the circular economy, we're right there, and we're doing a great job of uh, making this happen for our, our future generations, and that's what's important. So uh, I have a sandwich board up here of some of the stuff that we do in the Alliance. Yeah? Uh, 
Um, we have been using one of the, like your brown or gray bins to collect scraps. Uh -huh. And of course, you know, they tend to get you up even if you rinse them out after each time. But then we found, um, and I don't know the brand, some green, I'll call them plastic, but uh, some green um, bags. Uh, bags. The bio bags. That are called compostable. Yeah. And so I'm curious, I've been using those where I take them out and I dump out the stuff so it doesn't stay in the bag. I just throw it in the bag. Um, have you had experience with those, and do they truly degrade or get eaten, or do you know what happens with those bags? Well, there's, there's a couple of things, and, and it's a great point. Thank you. Uh, number one, uh, in commercial uh, uh, composting operations that aren't organic, the bio bags are fine to put in. If somebody is doing organic uh, composting, they have some issues with any type of plastics, whether it's a corn-based or uh, I don't know what the material is that's making the, the, the bags. So, you know, you can use the bag, you can pour the stuff out and then just throw the, the bag away itself. And that's, that's another thing. When you, I, I get a real charge out of looking at some of the advertising that's done uh, in our stores. Uh, where people are, you know, touting uh, compostable, and then you read the fine print, and I, I tend to stop when I see this, and read the fine print that says, in an industrial composting operation, may not be found in every place that you are able to go to. So, you know, have a jaundiced eye, uh, do your own composting, and be aware uh, Greenwashing does happen in some cases, and we try our best to just inform folks as, as they go along. And uh, our next step is gonna be uh, taking on packaging, because packaging is another example of where we can do so much better at reducing the amount of stuff that has to be uh, presented in purchasing products. Yeah. Just a question about um, sawdust. Sure. Uh, my husband at a wood shop and asked me to ask you <laughs> whether or not it's all right to put the sawdust in the compost. And I'm guessing it's okay, but in small amounts? You don't want to uh, no, I, give out your address to anybody who wants additional carbon material. Okay. Yeah, sawdust is great. Uh, you, 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 the only place I would... Uh, be a little bit careful would be if it was on a painted material. If you, okay. you if it had already been treated, then you wouldn't want to use it uh, in your bin. But if it's just, you know, pl planing something down, sawdust is wonderful. Uh, wood shavings are great. It's all good. You know, go forth. It, and the fact that it's so nice and compact, it'll help to damp down the, the odors. What you want to be careful, though, I mean, it's the on the one hand and then on the other hand, right. you want to make sure you don't compact stuff so tightly that air isn't able to flow through your material. You want to make sure that your bugs that are doing all the work, those fungi, those microorganisms, the bacteria, are able to munch and don't have to gasp for breath. So that's part of it. Yeah. And I'm asking this partly because I hope it benefits others um, that, like, like the um, uh, sawdust, which like, you don't want to clump up, you want to spread it around. I tend to put in the coffee filter, which has a bunch of coffee grounds. And I'm thinking that, that maybe instead I should you know, try to you know, dump it out so that the coffee grounds are scattered. Or does it make any difference, do you think, to the creatures to, to not have a, a lump of coffee in a coffee filter? Well, you can spread it out, and I'd tear up the filter a bit and put that right in, too. Yeah, then. Just going back, I'm sorry, can I uh, follow up question on the, the sawdust? Sure. I want to just, so let's say we get, you know, this much, we have a three foot bin. We want to layer the sawdust, though, right? You know, yeah, you don't want to put three feet, yeah, right. No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. You want, you want, okay. you, you want to make a lasagna. You want to. Yeah. You want to put your food scraps, you want to put your green stuff, then you want to put your brown stuff. Your nitrogen rich material, your carbon rich. Your nitrogen rich, your carbon rich. A few shots of dirt, 
Yeah. I was just going to ask you to expand on the carbon rich, but I'm gathering that that's the brown. That's the brown material, uh, dry leaves, uh, sawdust, shavings, uh, paper. If you're, if you're into shredding financial documents, that's a great way to you know, take your, your, your bank statements and have them do good things. Newspaper. Newspaper, absolutely. These days, newspaper is not, does not have any lead in the, in the ink, so yeah, it's all good. Yeah? Is there any benefit to, uh, we live in the city, is there any benefit to putting the bins on pallets? I've heard people like to put them on pallets. Um, One, I mean, you get air underneath, but is there other drawbacks to that? There's, there's no drawback other than depending on how you feel about uh, critters. Well, we, at least we don't have bears, but we probably have other critters. <laughs> right, and 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 once again, I you know I talked about this kind of bin. Uh, you can make bins with pallets using a couple. You can make bins with uh, wire mesh, just enclosing them. Uh, you can you can make bins uh, in any number of ways. There's a bunch of different uh, diagrams in the handout that I gave you. So you know everything. I'm giving you all permission to do your own thing and be proud of the result. I think, I think it's important to try, and that's all we ask. Yeah? To follow up, talk, with having, having it on the ground, wouldn't that even be better because the microbes and other things come from the ground and start eating away at the compost bins, right? It, it, it definitely helps. Yeah, that's a good point. Ignore my last statement. No, that's okay. <laughs> that's why I say this is our workshop. I want to. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Betty. What do you do with the K cups? What do you do with the K cups? Where do they go? <laughs> well, I, you know, there's a there's a couple of ways, and lately I've been using recyclable. You know, there's a my K cup, which you can pour regular coffee in and then put it into the K cups into the Keurig machine and then just empty the so the the that in there. Uh, or you can just empty the things out and dump them. Uh, the the train station was taking them yeah. and uh, I don't know what's going to be with that. Uh, they claim that the polypropylene is all recyclable. Uh, they do have a program to taking back the K cups, which I think would be, you have to pay for it. Uh, the, the problem is uh, the material recovery facility where all of our recyclables go has a limit on screening material. It can't take stuff that's less than two inches. It can't take stuff that's more than two feet in size. So the K cups fall through, and that becomes a problem there. And so the material is recyclable, but you got issues there. You know, I'm you know I'm a big fan of uh, coffee roasters and their and their and their coffee, but it is somewhat of a challenge there. Right, and, and, and I'm glad, you know, th this is not just a compost. You can ask me questions. Black, black plastic, you know, even number two black plastic, which is the polyethylene, is not recyclable because the color tends to uh, pr uh, uh, distort the products that they're making from that. So they tend to say no more black plastic as a result of that. And the plastics and I, the, the materials, things like the, 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 the plastic is going back and being made into uh, uh, Trex type wood for decking and uh, uh, plastic furniture. You see a lot of that ar around now. And so they, they, the, the black just tends to take off the spec on how to do that right. And uh, the three through sevens, they wind up using, they can make uh, paint cans, plastic paint cans out of. So you get a variety of different kinds of uh, plastics that are 
bunch together and they, uh, they reprocess them that way and pelletize. Yeah? I've never used one of the green cones and it seems kind of like magic that you can throw you know, meat products, including bones, in there, you know, chicken bones, beef bones, whatever. So how does it, how does it work and how long does it take to uh, decompose? Well, it's hard to believe that a bear will fit in one of those, but that's where the bears live. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, basically, here. The, uh, this is a, it's a two section thing, and it's a solar digester. So these are out, they heat up, and the warmth in, it, and there's an activator material that you put in with this. And you pour some of that in to help start up the process. But the warmth, uh, water going through with the bottom, and the, uh, and the material itself, the digestion from, the, from the, the, the bacteria, all starts the breakdown process. And that continues as long as there's fresh stuff it'll continue to break it down. So yeah. Again, oh, sorry. Um, you, you dig a hole yep. that's not clay. You bury the Well, hole. even if it's clay, as long as you amend your soil around it, you may have to amend a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. And then do you bury the laundry basket? Sort of yeah, place? yeah. And then how many inches up do you submerge the green part? Or? It's... <laughs> Mine is, mine is probably like around here, okay. so. And then is it sort of like a septic system? You, you're, you're not going to recover what? Absolutely. It's yeah, you're right. You're not going to recover. And you know, they say every five or so years, dig out whatever detritus is left in it. Uh, I've never dug out anything. And it continues to work. And that needs to be in a sunny spot. That, that should be in a sunny spot. And what, several things you want to consider. Number one, these you can use for like your pet waste. You don't want to do that for compost bins, but you can for that. But you want to look at what's down gradient of where you are. You don't want your, your, your vegetable garden to be the recipient of where all the stuff is going. But if you've got flowers, that's fine because the digested material is going to add nutrient into the soil. So that's the other, the other piece of that. Yeah? I had watched the video that you sent along with your email about that thing, and I'm super interested. I know you had said they may not be available today, but I see one here. Are you able to sell them or <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's I, I made, I, I don't want to say I made that mistake, but I did sell the last one at uh, last year, and I wound up having to beg, borrow, and steal to get one. Yeah, what's happened is we ordered a truckload of these uh, in March uh, from Canada. And the company in Canada where we had been buying them sold the dyes to a company in New Jersey, which last year was fine, and we were able to get them fairly rapidly. But then the company in New Jersey sold them to a company in the United Kingdom. Didn't tell us that. And the company we had been dealing with in Canada took our orders in March and said, yeah, no problem. And then the pandemic hit, and everything stopped. They closed the factory in the United Kingdom for a couple of weeks. And then they got started again. And in early June, we got a message the green cones have arrived in Montreal. <laughs> then they had to go to Ottawa, where they would be picked up and then driven to Vermont. Uh, as of yesterday, when I talked to the guy again, he said, we expect to be having the uh, contractor who does the trucking arrive Monday to pick them up. It's been a, uh, a nightmare of getting them. But I expect to have them ideally by next week. And I do have uh, enough of them this year for, uh, I think, the folks in the workshop. The price is going to go up next year because of uh, we're going to have to be changing a lot of things. 
because we had to hire a customs broker, and we had to hire, have to pay a tariff now. NAFTA went away. All these things that we never considered uh, in terms of the reality of our current world. So. Can we let you know then? Can you like email the group or something after you receive this? Uh, what I'd like is if you have signed up, uh, I'd like you to just add that you would like to get one uh, as well, a green cone. So I'll put this back over here. And uh, any other questions? I mean, it's, it's great to have a captive audience. Did you mention earlier uh, about that certain food crap could still go in trash? Or did that I it said what? Still go into the uh, trash? Line. What? Some food scraps. Oh, yeah, meats, meat, uh, fish, bones, and oils can still go in the trash. Yes. In the trash. Yep. Okay. The foam cups and stuff go in trash? The, the foam cups? Yeah. The, uh, the black plastic goes in trash. Uh, styrofoam goes in trash. It's not, and we're, we're getting away from that stuff. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the problem is styrofoam is recyclable. You want to remember, styrofoam is like potato chips. The size, the volume of material is so large for so light a material that the density has to be increased. And to buy a densifier is outside of our fiscal ability in this neck of the woods. So it really, it, it didn't pay to try and work through that. But some places have actually recycled styrofoam and you can use it to make uh, uh, Wayne's coating, and you can use it for picture frames and things like that. Yeah. So then, since we're recycling, also, um, at some point I was told, you know, we're, we're trying to separate what can be recycled and what can't. Sure. And at some point I was told that paper things, I think of Ben and Jerry's, um, you know, pint container, paper things that have a coating on it cannot be put in recycling. And so. Do you know if that is true? That, so, so I've been putting the Ben and Jerry's things in, in the regular trash because I understood it shouldn't go in. Yeah, there are, there are certain things that uh, the, the wax coatings create problems with the processing. Okay. And whether it's a Ben and Jerry's, uh, I don't know if they've got the same, but like uh, some of the, the gable tops of milk containers, milk cartons, uh, juice cartons. So in general, it should be plain paper. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you look, look closely at the material. And uh, once again, you are the consumer. You are the judge of what you're bringing home. And I think that's the important message to bring to all of you is you are what you eat and you are what you recycle and, re, you know, restore. And, and uh, the resources are in your hands. Trust me, <laughs> I recycled a lot more than you. <laughs> yeah, we are what we eat, yeah. <laughs> so, anything else? Betty? Well, one of the big things is with the church. Yep. How do you handle things? Right now, you can't make anything at church. Our church is closed, the yep. center church. You can't make anything, but you can bring in, I guess, of things that are wrapped up and and they can have snack with that but once we open up again the the girls have thought that if we had a container that we could put in the freezer for when they had a little uh, buffets or something they could put the food in that and then eventually take it to the uh, oh you mean the the scraps uh, uh, otherwise you know, right now we recycle bottles and a soda can. Right. But we have an AA groups that come in the church, you know, and it's going to be uh, mm -hmm. interesting. Well, the uh, handle thing. As far as the food scraps, you can put things in your freezer. It's the same as the food before you processed it and used it, uh, and then you can take it either to the 
transfer station or yeah. your compost. And since you're going to be composting more now, yeah. and go from there. Yeah. So I, I don't think that'll be a big issue. And uh, with AA, I would assume that they're not eating a lot of food. I would think it's just. Yeah, they, they have their snack at, after things. Well, I think you just say but to whoever. Right now, we've told them they can't do anything. Yeah, I just I would just say tell them they're responsible. It's like the state parks, pack it in, pack it out, so that when they're done with their meeting, whoever's the organizer, that person is responsible for taking the material away. That should solve that problem. Okay. Anything else? Well, I want to thank you all. I appreciate on a beautiful Saturday morning spending your time. I just have to unpack everything and. Uh, put it all together. It'll probably be about a half an hour, so go grab a, uh, a, a revivifier. Yep. For, for the green cones, what would you like us to indicate? How, how would you, we don't have to write green container. No, just put GC uh, okay. next to your name. And uh, if you've got your phone number there and your email, I will get in touch with you. I will have them over at the uh, armory. And, and basically, I get downtown most every day. So when I know I've got a window of time, I'll just try and get everybody uh, notice on what day would work. And if that doesn't work for everybody, we'll find another time. How much are they for this? These are 125. Uh, normally, they're 150. If you go online, you're going to find they're more than like $200. And unfortunately, after this year, I think they're going to be more than. And the, uh, these things, we're actually selling it under our cost for the folks that take the workshop. Because anybody that puts up with me making a presentation <laughs> has to get paid something. But these are 35 for people who have taken the workshop. And 52 is our normal truckload sale, which is actually about half what they are if you go to a place like Gardner Supply. Yeah? Um, one of the things you mentioned, um, I'm glad you covered bears, but um, winter composting. So I put our bin where it's close enough I can get to it even in the winter, and I'll shovel around it. Uh -huh. um, is the only thing I can think of is paper for dry material to put in, as well as food scraps during the winter, or do you just not worry about it and just put in the food scraps? What I, I say, I take and pick up a lot of bags of dry leaves in the fall. And I just put them in these contractor bags, put them in the open bay of my garage. And then, you know, when it's time, I always add that. And if you're, if you're close enough to your house that you can do it in the winter, that means you may have time to be able to uh, stir stuff to keep everything going. But things will slow down. I mean, I don't want to paint any rosy picture. It's, uh, it's Vermont and it's winter. And global warming hasn't hit the compost bin quite as well. They don't all die. I hope they just go to sleep in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. How well do the green cones work in, uh, in the winter? Those, you know, because they are below grade, they are going to be uh, more effective. But you want to be careful, because if you start putting all your food scraps in there, they say not to put much more than two or three pounds a day in and uh, you can fill it and then you're going to lose your effectiveness so you want to be careful yeah so i don't know if i remember on the other workshop that you said that you could all, always have two of this and then use one in the winter and then one regular you can never have too many compost bins <laughs> no you can you can do that you can also have a garbage can and store your yeah. uh you know a, a, a closable lockable type a uh, uh, garbage can to keep the critters away. So anyway, well, thank you all. I appreciate your time. Would you like help packing up? Uh, I never am going to say no to that. <laughs> It'll make it go faster, but I do have to take some things apart. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.